My name is Sami Kassab. I'm a research analyst here with Masari or with Masari. I specialize in Bitcoin as well as Web3 infrastructure. Um, today, I want to talk about smart contract programming languages. And so what we've seen in the past few weeks is two emerging high performance L1s, Aptos and Sui, have generated quite a bit of buzz. And both these L1s use a new smart contract programming language known as Moo. And this was originally developed um, by Facebook for the DM blockchain. And so Move has essentially just like reignited this debate over which smart, smart contract language is the best. Uh, today, I will be diving deeper into that conversation. I have with me a diverse group of panelists from different ecosystems, ranging from Cadena to Stax to Moonbeam. And we're basically going to be discussing the pros and cons of their respective ecosystems programming language. So to get things started, I'd, I'd be pleased if everybody could please just introduce themselves, which ecosystem they're building in, and then just briefly mention which smart contract programming language they use. And we'll go ahead and start with you, Max. Yeah, certainly. Um, Max Efremov, I um, at Hero support the builders and developers uh, on the Stacks blockchain and Stacks ecosystem. Um, the smart contract that I'm going to be talking about is Clarity. Um, and before this, before uh, uh, developer, ad developer advocacy at Hero, I was a machine learning engineer who also doubled as a crypto educator, for both retail and a little bit of uh, builders yeah, before I got into supporting developers. For Derek. Hey, yeah, so I'm Derek Yu. I'm the CEO of CureStake, and we work on the project Moonbeam. Uh, so Moonbeam is built in the Polkadot ecosystem. Uh, it's a layer one uh, smart contract platform that specializes in uh, cross-chain use cases and scenarios. Um, it's implemented in Rust and Substrate, but perhaps interesting and relevant to this discussion, it does offer a Solidity and EVM uh, compatible developer environment. So maybe I'll represent uh, that, that point of view on the panel today. And Francesco. Hey everyone, uh, Francesco, CEO of Cadena Eco, uh, Cadena's ecosystem growth arm. Um, we designed our own proof of work blockchain from the ground up to scale, um, and also our own smart contract language called Pact. Uh, and a fun fact for the Stacks Hero fam out there, we were actually quoted in, as inspiration in your first white paper that came out back then. Thanks everybody for the introductions. I, Go ahead, Max. I was going to say, I did not know that. Um, thank you, Francesco. I'm learning already. <laughs> I think it was in the yeah. very first version. I'm talking like maybe 2019 or earlier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it sounds like we have a diverse group of uh, programming languages. We have Clarity, Pact, and Rust. So. One that we all know about is Solidity. And just to provide a little bit of background to potential viewers who might not know much about Solidity, Solidity was really the first widely used smart contract programming language. Um, and it was built specifically to run Ethereum. And so essentially it was the first mover. And because of that, we've seen a large network effect created around Solidity. And a lot of newer layer ones, such as Polygon, Avalanche, and even um, Binance Smart Chain have added EVM compatibility because it makes it super easy to pour over applications from Ethereum over to um, different ecosystems. And so many people now believe that like smart contracts such as Move, Clarity, or Pact are the future of smart contract development. But there are some other people who might believe that there really isn't that much new functionality that's being added with these newer smart contract programming languages. And so the question I'll hand over to uh, Francesco first and then pass it over to you, Max, is what do you guys believe is either missing or inherently flawed in these existing popular smart contract languages such as Solidity and Rust? Yeah, so, um, you know, Solidity, I think, was an awesome first attempt at know, setting up a language for you know, the future of what's going to be smart contracts hosted on blockchains. Um, you know, and on that front, I think the main flaw with Solidity is it lets developers do too much. Um, I think here in this conversation, at some point, we'll get caught up in, 
you know, whether a language should be Turing complete, like Solidity that lets you do everything under the sun or something that's more Turing incomplete, like Pact and Clarity and other languages coming out. Uh, you know, a way that I like to compare that is uh, basically like with a Turing complete language, you can write some code where the surface area for bugs is pretty much the whole world. Um, whilst if you have something that's Turing incomplete, um, it's more like the surface area for a bug might be the size of a small room. Uh, and it's much easier to, you know, go around and sweep and hoover up what's in a small room than uh, keep it in account for what could possibly be out there uh, in the whole world. Um, so that's kind of our first view into why we went and built our own smart contract language with Scratch, because it's certainly no easy feat. Yeah, Max, would you agree with those with those flaws? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, Solidity uh, being the first smart contract programming language, uh, its development was in advance of all of the incredibly useful knowledge that we came into after the innovation that, that we saw. Um, what with uh, smart contract capable applications, decentralized finance, these things were all technically possible at the beginning, but it took years for them to uh, be developed and innovated. Um, and when Solidity was created, um, uh, the different design uh, principles that were applied, there's simply just no way of knowing um, what that world would look like. And uh, the default was made towards, yeah, let's give the developers uh, the possibility of creating more or less anything. In fact, who would even want to argue or make the case for limiting developers or uh, kind of encumbering them in some way? Uh, what I would love yeah, to get into at some point is, is that um, Turing incomplete languages, also known as decidable languages, um, they may uh, theoretically limit a developer and what it is that they're um, uh, capable of doing, but pragmatically, uh, practically speaking, there isn't actually very much solidity functionality that we can't replicate if we decided. And the benefit is, is that a, a whole host of um, vulnerabilities are fundamentally impossible. Um, in a Turing incomplete language, uh, making the what we have discovered these economic resources that are staggering in their their value. The sums that are being hacked on a daily or weekly basis are you know seven, eight, nine figure sums. Um, those resources need to be as protected and secure as possible. And so that's what um, those are some of the design principles that Pact and Clarity have uh, made at kind of the center of the language design. Great. Derek, Moonbeam is written in Rust, and so it's essentially Turing complete. How would you respond to what Max and Francesco have, have said? Would you widely agree with them, or, or how would you push back? Yeah, um, so I, I would I would agree. Um, I you know I would say, and just for context, you know, Moonbeam itself is implemented in uh, Rust and using the Substrate framework, but it does offer this EVM compatible environment for developers. So that's the the product basically that is being put to developers is this Ethereum and EBM compatible environment, much like uh, you were mentioning Polygon, um, BNB chain uh, and others. Um, so it offers a, a similar approach. Um, security is the main, it will be the main uh, criticism. I would agree with that. Um, you know, Solidity was designed in an era before a lot of these, um, you know, these security threats and, you know, the amount of values at stake were kind of understood, what, you know, what it was going to look like. I would actually add to the criticisms that you know throughput and concurrency is also like not something that was really part of the original design of the EVM itself. And so, yes, while there's people have figured out clever optimizations and done things, it really is something that wasn't part of the original uh, design. Uh, so those are you know those are major you know those are major kind of drawbacks. Um, just to go to the other side though, there are some major benefits, and uh, you mentioned some of them in this portability. But uh, for me, um, I would say that it's this this kind of whole ecosystem of dev tooling and infrastructure. Um, this stuff is like hard and it takes like a long time to build and it's, you know, it requires huge amounts of investment. Uh, and so by being EVM compatible, you kind of inherit like all of these tools, you know, even consider Moonbeam, you know, there's an Etherscan deployment, there's Chainlink, there's just all these kind of tools and infrastructure that you kind of, I won't say you get them for free, but they're part of this whole ecosystem that's grown around the EVM. And that does help with dev adoption, right? In this world, dev adoption is kind of king. And so I, you know, that's kind of the, some of the benefits is you kind of have this rich set of tools, developers can kind of, you know, they, they kind of have feel like, um, you know, a lot of their needs are taken care of and you, you get this stuff almost for free when you implement into this Ethereum tech stack. 
Um, you know, the second thing I would say that is a big plus is compatibility. So even, you know, when you're, uh, for us, for example, at Moonbeam, you know, we're specializing in these cross-chain use cases. Part of that means that we need to um, integrate with a lot of these new like interoperability networks. And, um, you know, being EVM compatible, I can tell you whenever you're talking about any like third party trying to integrate with you, you immediately, that's like a different discussion and like much, much easier than if you have, you know, some, uh, you know, a different, you know, a different tech stack uh, implementation. So, you know, for us, that's, you know, Axelar, Layer Zero, Wormhole, and all of these other cross-chain messaging protocols that are implemented on Moonbeam. So that was, you know, given what we were trying to achieve, we knew that using this, using this EVM compatible approach would make it easier for us to kind of execute on our, on our strategy. Great. If so, I could, if I, if I could, and just to um, add to, to Derek's point, of, um, if I may, uh, Sammy, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it is t totally the case that given the Solidity um, uh, language's kind of pioneering status, um, yeah, the path dependence of developer resources and community is staggering, and that is um, maybe the uh, single biggest drawback to adopting any non-Solidity um, language. And uh, the way that I see it is, is that there's a drag force um, on uh, solidity-based smart contracts. And that drag force is the attack surface. And so in a way, the composability that you mentioned as being a benefit to um, uh, the solidity ecosystem and um, uh, applications written on it, uh, the, the open question for me is, is the benefit derived from the composability um, is kind of one vector that um, is also kind of competing in some uh, sense against the vector of the increasing attack surface because of the like kind of faulty underlying nature of solidity. Um, and so for me, the question is, is these um, hacks and bugs and exploits seem to just monotonically increase. And at some point, will it just get to be unacceptable? And at that point, um, um, maybe, you know, the, the community developer resources, the support, the kind of robustness of, um, uh, other languages um, and whatever other features their blockchains uh, also provide, that might be a, a finally a kind of um, uh, straw that breaks the camel's back and the adoption kind of hits. And then at that point, um, the network effect unwinds. So that that's that's just how I see it. It's this like yeah. attack surface, um, um, these two forces competing. Yeah, that's an interesting point of view. I mean, I think I, uh, you know, I agree with this drag effect, right? That, you know, the security is something that, you know, seems to be increasing in, in, you know, I mean, we were talking about earlier before we hopped on here, right, about this BNB uh, chain bridge, uh, you know, event that just happened. I guess my, you know, my, my view though, is that it's not like a single threaded like evolution, but rather, you know, we're moving into this multi-chain kind of world where there's going to be different environments, different VMs um, that can specialize and, you know, specialize in serving different kinds of use cases, um, you know, better. And you know, part of this like world, when you, once you connect these different environments together, you know, then I think there really is an opportunity to kind of you know, have different environments serve different use cases, but then you know, uh, leverage, you know, an app developer can leverage you know, different like VMs, let's say, you know, for different parts, uh, you know, different, different kinds of use cases. And then you have this whole is greater than some of its parts you know, opportunity uh, to, to take things that the EVM does well in terms of compatibility, let's say, and interoperability, uh, but maybe combine that with you know, workloads or logic that's running, you know, in a more specialized environment that has offers different kinds of security properties. And so that's kind of the, the world I see where there's, you know, going to be multiple different kinds of environments and, you know, you, you'll be able to in the future potentially mix and match like, you know, which ones you use um, in service of, you know, the application you're building. Yeah, and just, uh, just to add to that too, uh, you know, I think we may need to zoom out a little bit and realize how early we are in terms of adoption. You know, I understand that, of course, there's been hundreds of thousands of man hours gone into the tooling surrounding EVM and Solidity and, you know, deploying and writing smart contracts and all of that. But I think the latest stats I saw were something like five or 10,000 Web3 devs. And obviously that number is going up, but, you know, compare that to the number of full stack devs in the world, which is 20 million, um, there's definitely an opportunity to bring in that, you know, the rest of the world. Uh, of the programming world into blockchain itself and to doing that in a way that's innovative and more secure. You know, I mean, the, the real question here is like, is Solidity, you know, an early attempt at a smart, of building a smart contract language? Is it, you know, and everyone knows its faults and whatnot and all the trade-offs of doing it. And the real question is like, is it more like something like PHP or is it something like JavaScript that we're probably going to be stuck with for 
uh, you know, foreseeable futures, potentially the rest of our lives. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. I, I kind of see it. Um, I mean, this my personal knowledge is more like C programming language, where it it's like it allows a developer to make like terrible mistakes, you know, and and uh, you know a lot of the world security problems have arisen from like misuse, like in the you know C programming language. But nevertheless, it was this early thing, you know, it 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 kind of is at like the base layer of a lot of things still, right? Um, and then new languages come around, so like you know Rust. I mean, we're using Rust, right? Which improves upon. Um, you know, and kind of guards against a lot of the most common like uh, problems that you can, you know, shoot yourself in the foot with like when it comes to C. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't mean that C didn't have like a, you know, prominent place, an important part of the story of just the development of compute operating systems, you know, all the rest of the tech stacks we work with. Um, yeah. yeah, Derek, so it sounds like the desire to go with Rust was, you know, the desire for EVM compatibility the need to be interoperable in a multi-chain environment. And then, like you mentioned, um, able to have access to infrastructure that's already built out and to a larger developer um, pool. So the question I'll pose to Max and Francesco then is what desired features led to the decision of, you know, creating a new programming language um, over going with one of the existing ones. And so maybe you guys can quickly just touch on um, the need for being Turing incomplete and having a decidable programming language, and then maybe also the benefit of having human readable code. So if you can quickly touch on those, we have a few minutes left. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, briefly, um, it would be something like um, a decidable language gives you um, a special kind of uh, the simplicity when it comes to reasoning and analyzing um, your contract and the call graph. So the other contracts that your contract will kind of interact with. Um, there are no, there's no recursion possible. There's no conditional jumping. And so you get this nice effect of being able to uh, see exactly what will happen uh, deterministically. Um, uh, and just reason and analyze about the code um, a, a lot more. Also providing, by the way, precise gas estimation, because you actually know how much this is going to cost. Um, also, uh, it is really designed with security in mind, and that means imposing uh, a number of defaults that the developer has to opt out of explicitly. So there's just, you'll see this throughout um, uh, different code. It's a little bit more explicit um, because of various defaults that um, when again, kind of given some of the latitude that uh, program, uh, programmers and developers have and solidity, they just wind up being sources of bugs. And then um, uh, lastly, uh, uh, last two things, uh, in interpreted, meaning the language, the source code is published directly to the blockchain. We're not introducing uh, any compiler bugs, and also you can see the code um, uh, directly on the blockchain. And then lastly, anchored to Bitcoin. Um, this is, uh, Stax has uh, native insight and read uh, capacity into Bitcoin state, and we find that useful for creating all sorts of applications, not to mention um, our state exists, therefore, on the, on the Bitcoin blockchain, and it's decentralized and the most secure. Awesome. Anything, Thanks, Max. Yeah, anything yeah, in addition so, to add to that, Francesco? No, totally. So uh, agreeing to all the above and PAX implemented um, pretty much all of that apart from obviously the Bitcoin side of things. Um, you know, on top of that, uh, because, you know, as a decidable language, like Max was saying, uh, we're able to also build formal verification into PACT, uh, which means it, you know, really causes any sort of bug surface for doing any bad math or even extends to things such as people that shouldn't be writing to a database, writing to a database. And, you know, just covering those two things, I think covers sort of the vast majority of, you know, the bugs that we've seen recently in Solidity. Great. Well, looks like we're out of time. Time really flies by so fast when you're up here. I came with like 10 questions. We only got to about three of them, but Nonetheless, it was great getting a chance to um, chat with you guys. Um, it was a pleasure and thank you for being here.